not easy. Yeah. I, go, I go to the tree like I'm hunting. Scent control is huge. I put my camera in the ozone bag, you know, um, everything. I make sure deer are not going to smell me. I mean, they're still going to smell you, you know what I mean? But everything you do helps a little bit. Making sure whatever stand we get, the wind's right. I'm always on the apps, like checking the wind direction, checking the barometer, doing everything and going over it with Aaron or Rock or Chuck or James, whoever, making sure we're in the right set, you know, that it's going to work. Because you can't just pop yourself up in any tree and have all that extra scent and everything else and think you're going to kill a deer. Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast, episode number 273. J.C. Hall, open season and on the road. Support for the Big Buck Registry and the Deer Hunt Podcast comes from Rackology. Everything you need in one bag. Now available at Rural King and Orsland Farm and Home storefronts. Or online at www.rackology.org. Minus 33 Merino Wool Layering System. Timeless natural insulation, keeping you warm on the coldest days while staying breathable and wicking away moisture on the wet ones. Without the old school itch of regular wool. Grizzly Ears. The most advanced engineered wireless earbuds for the outdoors. Covert scouting cameras. Remote cameras for hunting, wildlife, and security. Quiet Cat, the all-terrain electric bicycle. Visit quietcat.com. That's Q-U-I-E-T-K-A-T.com. And use the discount code BIGBUCK15 to secure 15% off your next Quiet Cat purchase. And Big Buck merch. You can get cool, high-quality Big Buck t-shirts, long-sleeve t-shirts, and hoodies and show support for this podcast by visiting www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash M-E-R-C-H. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. Hey, this is Bob Dumong from the Buckhorn Boat Dog, listening to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. Hello, this is Cuz Strickland with Mossy Oak, and you're about to listen to the podcast that I listen to 16 and a half hours nonstop. The Big Buck Registry is the best out there. Hey, y'all, this is Heather Shepard with To Be Outdoors and the Dixie Deer Classic. You are about to tune in to my favorite podcast, The Big Buck Registry. Hello, ladies and gentlemen and fellow predators. My name is Jay, and thank you for tuning in to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. For Dusty Phillips and Jim Keller and the entire staff here at the Big Buck Registry, welcome to this week's show. There are a couple things I'd like you to do for us if you could. If you would, please check us out on iTunes. Subscribe and leave us a review. With your help, we're going to try and push this show up the iTunes charts. I know we have a lot of listeners out there, and I need you to take some action. I need you to leave a review and subscribe to the show. If you do subscribe, that'll give you access and notification each and every week that a new show is released. You can also access this show in its entirety on YouTube, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, and as an Amazon Alexa skill. Go to Alexa and say, Alexa, enable Big Buck Registry. It's all right there for you to access on demand at your fingertips. Regarding the harness program, we have an ample supply of harnesses to give away from our volunteer donors. If you're in need of a full body harness, please send an email to j at bigbuckregistry.com. J.C. Hall might not be on the trigger most of the time, but he's hunting all of the time. When he does hunt for himself, it's a quality over quantity kind of thing. These days, J.C. is frequently on tour with the likes of country singer Aaron Lewis, and he's running the camera or editing the show for On the Road Outdoors. J.C. says he's always hunting in a sense because the footage needs capturing, and he doesn't want to be the guy that messes up the hunt. J.C. is an interesting guy with a colorful past. He studied golf at Penn State, was a pit crew member on the NASCAR circuit, is now a producer for Open Season TV and editor for On the Road. We'll get to our entire interview with J.C. Hall in just one moment. But before we do, let's hear from our friends at Rackology, Minus 33 Merino Wool Products, and Jim Keller with the Deer News. (laughs) 
Hey, it's Eric Fitzgerald here at Rackology. Wanted to visit you briefly about one of the most exciting products that we got in the market with Rackology. This is our food plot fertilizer. You can supplement your deer right through your food plot with this product. This is not your normal NPK. This has got so many goodies in this bag. Basically what it does is it makes your soil work for you so you can get by with just using fertilizer like this and not a lot of synthetics. If you want a good food plot and you want deer coming in and healthy, healthy plants, look at the food plot fertilizer through Rackology. Check us out at rackology.org. Thanks for tuning in. Let's talk about a hunter's layering system for a sec. We need to be ready for any weather that Mother Nature throws at us. With the layering concepts that Minus 33 has created with their incredible merino wool products, they've got you covered. The Minus 33's merino wool expedition weight garments will keep you warm on the coldest late season days while regulating and wicking away moisture in a way that only merino wool can do. You see, wool will absorb up to 30% of its weight and moisture without leaving you feeling wet or clammy, and wool insulates better than cotton or polyester and protects against hypothermia on those late season hunts. And here's another interesting point. You might not think of wool for early season, but with the Minus 33 wicking technology, I'll take a lightweight Minus 33 base layer any day in warm weather. Merino wool fibers naturally reject any bacteria found in moisture or sweat and gives you double protection against odor as your target buck approaches. Visit www.minus33.com to learn more about Minus 33's layering technology. Use the code BIGBUCK33 to get 10% off your next order. Now here's Jim Keller with the Deer News. Our first story this week. Woman claims Tinder banned her over hunting photos, calls out double standard. This story is from the Fox News website and was reported by Alexandra Diabler. One woman was banned after taking a shot at love. A Vermont woman is claiming she was permanently removed from the popular dating app Tinder because of her hunting photos. The woman, who wishes to only be identified by her first name, Nicole, said she was vacationing in San Francisco and opened up Tinder to show her friend her profile. A couple of hours later, she opened the app. She said she got a notification and a gray screen that read, Your account has been banned for activity that violates our terms of use. Nicole said she has two hunting photos of herself on the app, but that she cropped each picture to be in compliance with the app's regulations. I cropped it so there were no weapons, no blood. My family, we are not trophy hunters. We hunt for food, Nicole told ABC7. We respect the animal. We respect the outdoors. We eat every part of the deer that we can and only take shots when we feel it's going to be a good shot and it's going to take the animal as quickly and painlessly as possible. However, someone in the Bay Area found Nicole's photo of her with a harvested deer to be offensive and reported it into the app, as well as tracked down her employer and sent him a message about the hunting pictures. Nicole was shocked, finding none of her profile pictures offensive. She reached out to Tinder to inquire about the ban, but received no response until she posted on Twitter, along with a handful of men who had also posted hunting photos and had not been banned. Nicole's profile was reinstated, and Tinder is looking into the matter. She also reached out to report the original user for harassment after emailing her boss. However, there has been no update as to whether her profile was banned, and Nicole is not sure if she wants to continue using Tinder. A spokesperson for Tinder said in a statement to Fox News, we are committed to maintaining a positive ecosystem and take any reports of behavior that is contrary to our terms of use or community guidelines very seriously. We have a team dedicated to investigating each report. The account in question has been reported multiple times. The matter has been resolved and they can now use Tinder. New bill would let landowners sell deer permits to out-of-state hunters. This story is from the KSNT.com website and reported by Alec Gartner. Deer hunting is a big money maker for many rural areas in Kansas. People travel across the state and even from other states to participate. A new bill in the legislature would give those people outside of the state a new way to hunt in Kansas. Mickey Holloway runs Heartland Outdoor Trophy Hunts, a business that helps out-of-towners hunt in Kansas. He believes the new bill, which would allow people that own at least 80 acres to sell the deer permit they acquire to an out-of-state hunter, is a good idea. He said the reputation of big bucks in Kansas will always have people wanting to hunt here. Not everyone sees it that way, though. If you start allowing more people to come in and hunt and just hunt those, we're going to lose genetics. We're going to lose that revenue that we're gaining in this state through out-of-state hunters, said State Representative Eric Smith. But Corbett said each person has the option if they want to use the program. The bill would let one permit to be sold per landowner. It is planned for a final vote in the House Wednesday and, if passed, will head to the Senate. The legislature has failed to pass similar bills in years past, and on Tuesday, the House narrowly moved the bill forward by just three votes. 
Mississippi Deer Hunters Greeted by Bear Climbing Stand. This story is from the WAPT ABC Channel 6 website and was reported by Brooke Laser. Two Mississippi hunters were surprised to lay their eyes upon a black bear while deer hunting in Cleveland, Mississippi. Jordan Coopwood and Andrew Smith of Marigold were sitting in their ladder stand when two deer ran off suddenly. Shortly after looking ahead to their nearby food plot, the hunters realized the black dots they were seeing in the far distance were actually bears. One bear did not hesitate to physically climb the hunter's tree stand, smelling their honey buns that the hunters had packed for breakfast. Realizing the bear was getting closer and closer, Coopwood finally yelled and the bear immediately retreated. Mississippi's bear population has vastly increased in the last few years. Typically, bears are attracted by their search for food, so hunters may pay close attention even when up off the ground. Check out WAPT.com for a brief video of the exciting hunt. Editorial. In the last episode of the Deer News, we included a story about the potential for CWD to infect humans, as well as a story about a doctor who claimed to have found a cure for CWD. A link to the story about a CWD cure was also posted on the Big Buck Registry Facebook page, and it went viral. The article about a possible cure for CWD has garnered so much attention, the National Deer Alliance posted a recommendation to urge caution when considering research claims on their website. We couldn't agree more, but do strive to represent current events related to deer hunting and deer hunting news stories. However, as you know, we also urge caution when it comes to hunting safety, whether it's related to tree stands, bears climbing after your breakfast, or the venison you are about to eat for dinner. That concludes this week's edition of the Big Buck Registry Deer News. Special thanks to Daniel Applebaum and John Geis for leads on stories this week. For links to the stories featured this week, please check our show notes at www.bigbuckregistry.com. If you have any ideas for future topics or have any questions about any of these topics, please email me at jim at bigbuckregistry.com. For the Big Buck Registry, this is Jim Keller with the Deer News. Thanks to Jim Keller for the Deer News. Without further ado, here is J.C. Hall. J.C. Hall, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? Hey, man. Good. Thanks for having me. So we're gearing up to to go to these days. I mean, you guys are always on the road. What's What's coming up next? Um, actually, we are leaving today for West Texas, about an hour south of San Angelo, to um, go thermal hog hunting and coyote hunting. I so love- that's kind of uh, it, it's the place we deer hunt and turkey hunt at in Texas. Right, right, right. So it, it's overrun with with predators and hogs. So we're just going to do our part and going out there and trying to control the population to make the deer herd and turkey herd kind of thrive a little better. You just took the words out of my mouth. You're doing your part yeah. to, to keep the predators under control and the hogs under control. Uh, I think that's great. I right. think that's part of, of hunting. I think everybody should be doing that. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's as, as hunters and conservationists, that's something that should be a top priority for everybody. I mean, not enough people do it and everywhere we go. I mean, not so much with hogs, with hogs in the South. Um, I mean, you see their population is just booming. Um, but coyotes, man, it's everywhere we go. We notice a lot more daytime activity when we're in deer stands yep. of coyotes. I mean, we were in Kansas this year and had a coyote bed down on top of a hay bale 40 yards in front of us in rifle season. Wow. And sun itself on top of a hay bale knowing we were there we were making noises at it i mean we didn't want to there's a couple of big deer in the area so we didn't kill it right right <laughs> you know but i what? mean it, it's just w- whenever you start seeing predators out in daytime not scared of humans you know you have a big problem yeah so you know, was yeah. it not getting managed that way and were they not taking care of the predators where you were um no they do um the whole off season they trap they do hunts it's just, I wow. mean, they're, they're getting smarter, you know? Right. It's like a, now I don't use that example. That's pretty bad. But <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you, you know, say you're hunting coyotes and you call them and five of them come running in and you shoot one of them, you know, it's going to be a lot harder to kill those other four now. Right. Education. You know, so, right, exactly. Um, so, gotcha. so that's part of it. And not enough people are hunting them. I mean, you're seeing now that um, they're trying to outlaw the coyote competition hunts where they have yeah. like uh, like big dog hunts and the most dogs and, you know, these groups are coming in and saying that, I don't know, that's 
I don't know what, what their right. deal is, but well, that, to me, it's silly. It's you, you know, they're silly, shutting it down, right? and and I mean, and they're not understanding that the hunters are more conservationists than anybody in these groups. You know, we care about the the wildlife more than anybody, and that's why you have to do it. You have to have population control. Right. You you can't so, you can't knock down a coyote population e- even if you hunted them no, endlessly. No. You just can't do it. The ho- same with the hogs. There's no solution there other than to maintain. Right. I mean, I've watched people poison hogs in the south, mm-hmm. um, and in two years, there's a thousand hogs on the property again. Right. You know, there's like you said, you can maintain it. And that's about all you can do. Yeah. Yeah. You will not but, wipe them out. That is impossible. No. So you're you're part of uh, Open Season TV. You're part of the on the roads or on the road outdoors. Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just going through some of your bio stuff here on on Facebook. You studied golf at Penn State. Tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was my deal, man. That was my dream was to be a professional golfer. No kidding. And um, yep, I uh, I went to college and played for a year and won money in a professional tournament and lost my amateur status and got kicked out of school. Wow. <laughs> so Whoops. that's 20 years old thinking, eh, you know, that's all right. I'm just here to be a golfer anyways. <laughs> and it turns out I'm really not that good. So that's why I do this now. <laughs> you know, guys always tell me that they're no good when they, when they are really good. Um, it's a humble thing. Yeah. It's just because so many people golf now, you know, so there's so many just thousands and thousands and thousands of people that are so much better than I am. So that's why I say, and by a lot of people say, I'm really not that good. Like, mm. I mean, I feel like I get you part any course in the country probably, but that's not good enough to really win anything. So, gotcha. you know, no. So you don't seem too torn up about it. Just get no, 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 I'm having a blast, man. <laughs> and you want some money. That's pretty good. Yeah. So you're you're from Pennsylvania originally. Yes, sir. Tell me about yeah. your life in Pennsylvania growing up. Mm. Pennsylvania, gosh. <laughs> it's so long ago. Mm-hmm. Um well I started I could do it with hunting. Um I started this whole deal, uh, me and my best friend in high school. We were watching, we used to watch, I'd stay over his house and we'd watch old Dan Fitzgerald videos. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, so you remember, you know, the VCR tapes and if people remember them. I do. I, I'm old <laughs> it wasn't enough. that long ago. You know, for me, um, that's nothing, but. Right. Yeah. Same here. Right. But we used to watch them all the time. And, you know, one day we're like, man, we could do this stuff. You know, like we had, my family had a cabin and close to uh, like 2,200 acres and his family had a cabin not too far away from it with like 1800 acres and nobody ever bow hunted, Hmm. you know, Pennsylvania was, I mean, they're known for their rifle season. You know, schools were off the first Monday and all that. And um, so we started bow hunting and we stole our grandparents, big old VHS cameras. (laughs) And we went up and just started filming ourselves hunting. And it took a couple of years, but finally, you know, we got some kills and man, I don't, I don't know. There's just something about it where I decided that's what I wanted to do the rest of my life. And the rest is history, I guess. Is Pennsylvania still one of the no hunting on Sunday States? It's actually right now. I don't know if they just voted on it or they're just about to vote on it, but it passed the first part the first deal I, I haven't lived there in a while so i was like trying to pay it follow it along on people talk about it on facebook you know mm. um but it really really looks like that it's going to pass this year that they're going to allow sunday hunting but as of right now they don't you know gotcha. it's one of the few states what's your opinion on that is that is that a good thing or a bad thing <laughs> man i i mean i never understood not being able to hunt on sundays i mean I understand some people don't want to hunt on Sundays and that's, you know, that's fine. But t- to me growing up there, I mean, it's Pennsylvania for the most part, the whole state's a blue collar, you know, working man state right. and people work five days a week, you know, from seven in the morning to five at night and they get to hunt on the weekends when you only get to hunt one day a week, 
you know, that's, it's not fair to people who work so hard their whole lives to have that other day taken away from them. Right. When every other state you can hunt on Sundays and, you know, I mean, people can't even go to hunt camp because, you know, they're going to drive two hours to camp and turn around and come right back home. I hear that. So I, I, I never really understood it. I never understood the point of it. Yeah. I think um, I think it has some religious backgrounds, but I, I hear that it, the opposition to that up until this potentially will get passed is was from or actually from the farmers themselves. Like they didn't want hunters to come to them on Sunday to hunt because th- that's a lot more interaction. Right? You know, they get right. they get one day off, and Pennsylvania is a pretty popular state to hunt. It is. There's over a million licensed hunters yeah, in Pennsylvania. Right. So, so you get a million hunters knocking on the doors to, to hunt on Sunday and, or you right. shoot one and it goes onto the neighboring property. Now you got to go ask permission to hunt on or right. recover on that property too. Like, I mean, I get it, but if you own your own property, you know what I mean? Or, uh, you, you should be able to hunt when you want to hunt right during the season, right. you know, gotcha. but like I said, there's, there's arguments on both sides of it, but. I mean, there's ways they could still have it and make everybody happy. Yep. Who's your biggest influence growing up? Deer hunting. <sighs> Deer hunting? Gosh, dang. Um, man, I, it, it has to be Fitzgerald's and, you know, the Realtree guys with, yeah. uh, you know, with the original Monster Book videos, um, the Primos guys, the Mossy Oak guys, all, all those guys that I used to watch when I was kids mm-hmm. when, you know, that's why I wanted to get into this. Yeah. You know, that's what gave me the drive and the passion for it. Um, so it's, it's I, I can't single out one individual. It's just, it's those core guys that back then it was a handful of people that was doing this. Do you have a mentor? You know? I mean, do you, is there actually an individual that you, that you, you feel like took you under their wing to teach you about the outdoors and how to go about this? Or are you one of those self-made guys or you, you just kind of jumped in kind of, kind of jumped in okay. yeah i mean i never went to school for it i just i mean there's people when i started doing it um that told me straight out and um ernie calendrelli yeah calendrelli was one of them from quaker boy yep that if i ever want to have a living make a living doing this i need to learn how to do something else besides hunt or hold a video camera and that is true, isn't it? I mean, so I, so I taught myself how to edit. I was like, well, if I could do everything, you know, it probably could make me more valuable to people. As, so. as you kind of dance around this, this industry for a while, you, and you talk to a lot of people, you realize that the vast majority of the people that you meet that are in the industry that are at shows, this is not their primary profession. There's usually some no. other profession that they're, that's their primary job. And this is right. There, like there's that. very, very few, even people who own companies within the industry have other jobs and other careers. Right. You right. Know? Um, and especially television guys, like people think, oh, these guys are so lucky they do this for a living. And, you know, this is their only job. Like, and these guys go out and work 50 hours, 50, 60 hours a week in a normal job and then squeeze this in just because they love doing it. You know, it's mm-hmm. not. There's very, very, very few that it's their full time job. Yeah, they like so. they're gonna do it anyway. So they they bring a, a video camera along and then turn it into some kind of a business, right? So that you right you you basically can create a business out of your hobby and uh, right kind of kind of works that way. Absolutely, and there's so much competition in it now. I mean, it's it's gotten when I started doing this. I mean, there's there wasn't a lot of people doing it. You know, like I said, there's those, I mean, there was DVDs, there was, uh, what was it, TNT Outdoors on Saturday mornings. Sure, yeah, man, I remember that. <laughs> TNT Outdoors, absolutely, yeah. that was one of the best. That was like it. You know, there's that, ESPN, too, was doing stuff. And, right. You know, a couple shows. You know, it was Primos and and Realtree and Mossy Oak. That, yeah. I mean, that was it. Yeah, because um, Strickland and I talked about this. Right, you know, he, he was, absolutely. You know, he was one of the the main guys early on, and I, I mean, right. Mossy Oak hunting the country. That was like mm-hmm. you, you live for that that moment just to see what the heck those guys were doing. That right. That mo- yep, know. it was that. It was Primo's Truth About Hunting. And yep. Monster Bucks. Yep. It was you know yeah, you kind of were... settled down and watched watched those three. Those were the big ones. Right. 
Yep. And, and now there's, oh my gosh, I, it could be thousands. You know, when you look at these digital platforms and YouTube channels, people have YouTube shows and mm. I mean, and with the networks too, with there being three major networks now, it's, there's a lot of hunting shows. There's a lot of competition. There's not a lot of sponsor money out there, mm-hmm. you know, which drives, I mean, it costs so much money to do, which I mean, a lot of people don't understand that either. I mean, you could go, you could break it down to what you pay in fuel and airplane tickets and it's not cheap, you know, and there's not a lot of money out there. So it's, it's tough, man. There's a lot of competition. Yeah. And it's, yeah, there's the barrier of entry has gotten so small. Like you, All right. with the advent of YouTube and, and Facebook and social media, you don't, you can go shoot your video. It may not be a great video, it might not be, right. be very well edited, but let's face it, none of those are, no matter what genre you're in. <laughs> right. right. They're not well edited. They're just, no, the jump cuts constantly. And that, that's what, right. that's what all, you know, a, a lot of this, viewership that's kind of where all the kids are right now right and and to me that's what separates them like i don't know we get we still get negative comments you know what i mean with people watching it and you got to look at it it's television and television has to be entertaining and if it's not entertaining people aren't going to watch it right so to me that's what separates you know the level of shows and the quality yeah if you sit down at your tv and you don't look away and you don't pick up your phone and the 30 minute show goes by and you're like, Oh wow, it's over already. That was awesome. Then that's successful. Right. Right. You know, if you're two minutes into it and you're like, Oh gosh, <laughs> dude's been whispering for two minutes. I don't even know what's going on. Right. It's, you know, it, it's gotta be entertaining. It's gotta be pleasing to the eye. It's gotta be funny. People's true personality has got to show out and, you know, be realistic none of us are actors <laughs> we're just hunters so yeah yeah i mean you're, you're you're an actor in a sense but you're not you know acting you're just being yourself right what right. Did, this is i mean this is kind of a, a, a tough question because you know we've gotten in some serious arguments uh, about the direction of outdoor television and where television is not where it once was and that the, the money's kind of drying up and then people are looking to these social media influencers and I mean, what's your answer to that? Where did, where does outdoor television go from here? Does it, are you, are you starting to look at other ways to get your content out compared to, I mean, DVDs, that was, that was one method for a while, but yeah, they don't even exist anymore. They don't, they don't <laughs> exist. Now it's all, and it's, I, I swear I woke up one day and it was all gone, you know, and I'm like, man, I'm getting old. I got to figure out, yeah. Kind of got to figure it out all over again. Right. But streaming's big and digital. Um, but with that, all the networks have those platforms available too. You know what I mean? So if you're a network television show, you're, you're getting that streaming, you're getting digital, you know. Um, yeah. Well, it's funny you say that because the, for the first time I've seen them start to catch up. Like they were the one, they're still, I mean, there's still the wire plugging into your house, right? Right. If you're watching any kind of television or streaming, they st- they still got to plug into your house and give you the feed, unless you're right. on some kind of digital platform I mean, or a digital satellite platform. Right. To me, television is always going to be there. I, I don't think it's going away. I think people get caught up in technology a lot. You know, like, oh, this is going all digital. This is all it's going to be, and TV is not going to exist. And I, I, I have a really, really hard time believing that because mm-hmm. – I mean, I'm not old. I'm 41, but I tried Sling TV and Roku and all that stuff, and it drove me crazy. I went back to Direct TV, you know, yeah. in a week. Yeah. Um, but that demographic from 35 on up, uh, for the most part, is sitting down and watching TV. Mm. So I, I don't think that's going anywhere. I think it's just it goes up and down. You know, um, obviously digital's being a huge platform but i think it's just going to be a, mm-hmm. a blending of both and you got to be to be successful you got to be everywhere right i mean you got to be in people's eyes the whole time so if the younger generation is all digital and streaming you need to be there too mm, that's but you a, still need to be on those television networks as well you know jc i think that that is 
a really good perspective. That's probably the first time I've heard somebody say that w- with some oh, wow. some very good clarity. Because you're right, and I, I I don't know if I realized it, but yet TV is not what it once was. That's for sure. I mean, I think we all right. all agree on that. But no, it's not it's DVR, and you know, right. I mean, but but it still exists, right? It still will exist in some format, and as long as you right. understand that. If you look at the pie, the big pie, right? Maybe that yeah. that traditional cable TV is not as big as where. Maybe you don't want to put all your marbles over there anymore. Maybe right. you divide it up because you got to go where, as you said, go everywhere, everywhere that mm-hmm. people are consuming this thing. You got to be absolutely. Um, and, and for your partner's perspective too, you know, sponsors, um, you got to be constantly on social media that. I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> right. Um, there's a lot of people who do it better than me and better than us, and, but you got to do it and you got to be on all those, hitting all those avenues, you know? So right. the the more, the better. Do you think that there's a compliment? Like I, I watched some, some pretty famous people on Instagram live last night and mm-hmm. it was, they were advertising for a a show that was airing on traditional television. Like they're using the social media and their their personal accounts to tell everybody, go watch my show that's gonna be out tonight. And, right. and but they were having just a conversation. Like they're they're sitting on their couches. One was laying down on a couch just having general conversation, bringing in one of the other actors to talk about the show itself. It's <laughs> It's strange, man, to me. I, growing up when I grew up, you know, like, I mean, you could say this as well. Anybody that was on TV, when you met them or got to go to an appearance, you know, I mean, that, that was a big deal. To me now, like with the social media, just like that, with you, like what you just said, it it brings everybody more personal, I guess is right. the way to say it. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um it adds an element there, that we haven't not, never seen before. Yeah, right? I'm right. trying to think of the right way to say it. Um, I'm still trying to figure out the right way to say it too. I don't have <laughs> yeah. an answer for that. I don't. I don't know what it is. Right. And because the, I mean, the conversation, and you're watching somebody just have this conversation like you're talking on a telephone. You know, right. there's no scripting. There's no editing. It's just pure raw, uninterrupted. Say whatever the heck you want. But right. The purpose is, to- and it's not just not just outdoor industry. I mean, it's everything. You know, like right. actors, musicians. Um, it's yeah, it's 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 universal. There's everybody's in the same right. boat. It's not just this this industry. It's right. this, it's everywhere. Right. I mean, social media is free, and everybody has it. Mm-hmm. Right. Everybody has it. My 11 year old son shoots archery and has his own archery page. Like he doesn't have it on his phone. We control it, but mm-hmm. everybody has it. So. You're in a world where so many billions of people, everybody has this outlet. So why not? You know, right? Yep. It's just. It's not what it once was. uh, No man, it's a lot to get used to. Yep. So I I want to talk some deer hunting with you and and talk about open season and and on the roads. But uh, before we get into that, I got to ask: former pit crew at NASCAR. Yeah. Really. Um. Yeah, so I um, I did that for ten years. Ten years, no kidding. I'm beat up, man. <laughs> it's gotta it, uh, be brutal. I mean, you're just throwing- it was because I was trying I was trying to do work a full time job in the hunting industry, the outdoor industry, mm. and it was very tough. Um, so at one point I was like, man, I can't do I can't support my family doing this, and I had an opportunity to go to North Carolina. And got invited to a pit crew, the pit crew training school. It just, I mean, woke up one day and I was like, all right, let's do it. You know, opportunities, you got to take advantage of when an opportunity comes your way. And you only live once. Yeah. Now, a lot of people think different about this, but you get one chance at life. So do as much as you can, you know, make it memorable. So I moved to North Carolina, went to this thing and took a chance. And So it's a pit, pit, when a pit, pit crew training school? Yeah, it's that? called it's called Pit Crew U. No yep. kidding. So they actually mm-hmm. have their own school. They do. You got well, it makes sense. I mean, you, there's a lot that a lot of, a lot right. of danger involved. And, and that's kind of now they look the bigger teams, Hendrick Motorsports and and Roush and Gibbs and 
Richard Childress, what they're doing is they're bringing in athletes. Um, a guy who has played a year in the NFL and didn't really make it or is on a practice squad. Um, Major League Baseball players who would play a year or two and kind of get weeded out. They're they're recruiting those guys on the pit crews now. Yeah, you know, so yeah. it's it's becoming more athletic of a thing. But I'm no super athlete or anything. But <laughs> I could go for 11 seconds. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> I get a half hour break in between. But right. It was uh, it was an experience, man. It was a lot yeah. of fun. Well, that's um, cool. That's cool. It was definitely a single man sport and job. Um, I was married, had my son, so it was it was it was tough. It was tough on my wife, but mm. you know, ten years was enough, and I came back into this. Gotcha. All right. Yep. So tell me about open season TV. We've heard a lot. We've had James on the show. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think you talked to Chuck recently too, didn't you? I was just about to say we've had Chuck on the show. <laughs> yeah. So James and Chuck have both been on the show. I mean, I I I'm a big fan of of open season TV and the guys. I mean, right. not only just from a, from an out, outside looking in, but you know, an insider looking out. You guys are quality individuals. Chuck's a quality individual. James, yeah, is, I just sure. love talking hunting with with both of them. And, right, um, they're extremely passionate about it. Yeah, and you know, that's why they do it. Yep. Um, so that it's it's the contrast is is great. Like open season is man, like you know they have a, they have a pro staff, um, and it's a good quality show, and it's hunting, and it's funny that on the road is more entertainment and hunting. It, they contrast each other, mm-hmm. but they hunt together all the all the time. So. Um, how'd you get yeah. hooked up with those guys? anything you want to know i'll i'll, I'll yeah. spill all the beans on them let's we'll start with how'd you get how'd you get connected <laughs> to them i mean I, I, that's uh they find you or do you find them uh, yeah just just being around the industry for so long it's a very very small industry you know once you get in it and um i can't even tell you where i met chuck and james for the first time hmm. <laughs> um they they had another uh, editor producer and I don't know really what happened there, but um, Chuck had called me and asked me if I'd be interested in, in doing their show. And I mean, I was all about it because they actually, they've been around forever, you know? So, right. And like you said, they're good quality people. Very, and, very much so. Right. And that's pretty much it. And they, they called me. Oh, that's I don't cool. know. They're All probably right. they're probably they're probably regretting. They, it now, are they but... reconsidering their <laughs> their uh, choice there at this point. I'm, I'm sure they are, <laughs> but I'm not going anywhere. Yeah. So right. I hope. <laughs> so you're an editor on that show, which, as you said, you got you you know you had to develop editing skills, and that's how you're 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 making some uh, profession run out of this, right? But you've also taken on this producer role with On the Road Outdoors and. Right. That's that's with Rock Bordelone and and Aaron mm-hmm. Lewis. Right. So how did how does that come together from open season? Is that part of that or is that how are they separate? Um Rock and Chuck are very, very good friends. And they hunt together a lot. They have leases together all over the country. Um so it's not they're not the same show or you know, what I mean they're not yeah. partners together or anything like that. Gotcha. They just, they're together a lot hunting. So, um, I was actually living in, Mon- I moved to Montana. Um, after NASCAR, I managed an outfitting business in Kentucky for three years. Then I moved to Montana because gotcha. I thought that'd be a cool place to live. Right. And was it, it was a very cool place to live. And okay. It was very, 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 very cold. So <laughs> I wasn't yeah. built for it. Yeah, that's a cold area. There's no doubt. But that was that was another time, you know. I was like, man, I, I just can't do this no more. I gotta we're gonna go somewhere and just live a normal life. And okay. went to Montana and I was a substitute teacher and the head high school basketball coach and the assistant football coach for high school. <laughs> and <laughs> the NASCAR thing, you know. So right. Uh, out of the blue one day, I got a phone call wanting to know if I could 
fly to Ohio the next morning and film Aaron um, on a deer hunt. He was on this big deer and they had him on camera coming in and uh, they needed to film and they couldn't find anybody. So, I mean, they could find people, but, you know, it was somebody they knew and kind of trusted. Yeah, I mean, this, and I knew the guys, you know, so I was like, ah, like, you know what? I don't have anything going on. I'll, I'll do it, you know, as a favor. Yeah. And three days after I got back, they called me and offered me a full-time job. Very cool. But on the road. So that's kind of how that started. And then Chuck and Rock kind of talked to me, and that's how I started doing open season. They're like, oh, well, you know, you're doing our show. You might as well do Chuck's show, too. Gotcha. All right. So you're like, I love <laughs> so it's kind of thrown two, into it. I'm like, oh. Two birds with one stone. I'm just one here. person. Y'all know that, right? Right. right. <laughs> So you got, you, but I'm not you, afraid. I'm not afraid to work. So, but you got your full time job too, working in the outdoor industry. So, what what right. are you doing? Are you, are you the camera guy, editor, producer? What what do you what roles are you playing in, in all, all that? All of that. All of that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and with with on the road, we have another another editor. Okay. Um, Al Lambert, who is Rock's cousin. Okay. And um, uh, he's doing an awesome job and taking a ton of stress off of me um but yeah still do ever maintaining relationships with our partners and sponsors and logistics that's a it's a good one Logis- gotcha. logistics sure. and a- 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 analyst i guess we'd call it okay all right so so <laughs> part travel agent and so there there's more to this producer side than than just sitting down editing a video show it sounds like uh, you're, you're doing more. a lot more than that yes yeah way more than that i mean maintaining good relationships with your sponsors is absolutely key to everything mm-hmm. and if both sides aren't equally getting what they need and what they want it's never going to work so that's a big part of it how do you, you know, go, just, how do you go into that conversation like I'm sure a lot of people are asking this, going to listen to this and they'll say, okay, well, let, how, how do you maintain that, that, and do you set the stage in the beginning? How do you let each other know what to expect? It's all about expectations. I would imagine. Yeah, it is. It is. And you got to put all that out up front and then you got to, you got to maintain it. Like just, um, being available is key. Like, mm. you know, at least a couple of times a week, making a phone call and, you know, seeing how they're doing. Is there anything else we could do, you know, to do a better job at representing them, mm-hmm. you know, and then just taking what they say and what they want and what they want to get out of it and making it happen. Gotcha. You know, it's, it drives the industry, you know what I mean? Those, those companies are the backbone of the outdoor industry. Right. So right. we need to re- maintain the best relationship we can at all times with all of them. Even, I mean, we'll go to shows and gosh, I mean, competitive. I think how to say this now too. Um, Like other companies that we're not partnered with. Yeah. You know I mean? Like we have, we try to have a good relationship with absolutely everybody, you know, not, not just our partners. Cause I said earlier, it's a small industry. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I mean, you never know what tomorrow brings, right? No, you don't. <laughs> so if, if you didn't maintain a good relationship with others. Right. One day. And that's you, just, I mean, that's just life. That's not even in, in right. the industry. I mean, you want to have a good re- relationship with everybody you come in contact with. Right. That's you know a, what I mean? And you got to take that through this industry and through life and everything else. You don't want to leave the bad taste in anybody's mouth. Yeah. Everybody in life makes mistakes. You know what I mean? It's how you come back from them and just just generally be a good person you know and you'll be right. successful it, it's it, that's so. that's a good way to state it that's a life lesson that's not just All this right. industry or anything else All right. uh, let's take a little break and when we come back we'll continue our conversation with jc hall from open season tv and on the road Rackology Deer Supplement and Attractant developed through years of intense scientific research comes a product that puts it all in one bag. Superior Attractant scientifically formulated vitamins and minerals and all at a much better price. To get yours today please check out Rackology.org for a list of dealers. Rackology how can you afford not to use it? Everything deer need all in one bag. 
And now back to our conversation with J.C. Hall from Open Season and On the Road. So you've, uh, I'm trying to figure out when you hunt. I mean, when do you get to hunt? If you're doing all this producing and videography <laughs> and editing, when do you get to go out? I don't get too much anymore. Okay. Right. <laughs> I, I used to be a gr- uh, pretty good at it. <laughs> That's why I got into it. You know I, mean? I mean, you get into this because right. you love to hunt, you love right. the outdoors. And, I mean, when I grew up in Pennsylvania, you couldn't hunt till you were 12. And I remember when I was like six, five and six years old, just going to deer camp with my, my dad and my grandfather and just sitting in the stand with them, you know? And I mean, that was life. And you looked forward to the day you turned 12 years old that you could finally hunt, you know? And that's how I grew up. And I mean, it's been a part of my life since I guess, the day I was born. Right. I mean, there's been, that has always been a huge part of me. Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, that's how I knew that's what I, this is what I wanted to do the rest of my life. I can't believe it actually worked. Right. <laughs> right. Um, man, I used to hunt all the time, but it's when we, when we take a break, like during deer season, if we have, I mean, rock and Aaron are very busy, you know, with their normal lives and normal jobs mm-hmm. and, you know, they can't hunt 200 days a year. So, Whenever those little breaks are, I mean, I, I get just get out as much as I possibly can. Um, last turkey season, I know it's a big buck registry, but um, <clears throat> I turkey hunted 68 days in a row <laughs> with Aaron. And <laughs> I was living on his tour bus and going from show to show and finding places to hunt in the morning. And then he had to go home for three days. And I was in, I don't remember, Kentucky, I think. So instead of driving all the way back to Louisiana, then driving to Ohio, because that was the next place we were going to hunt three days, mm-hmm. that wouldn't have really made sense to do that. Right. So I just drove to Ohio and called one of my buddies up, and I got to hunt for two days, and I killed two birds. Nice. <laughs> <clears throat> and it was like, dude, the world was ending. I was so freaking excited because <laughs> I finally got to hunt for myself and, right. and made it happen. So when I do get to hunt now, it but I don't take it for granted. Was Aaron on tour at that point? Yeah, he's always on tour. So if he's on tour, man, that's tough. I mean, he's a musician, <laughs> right? So you, you're probably playing late gigs. Turkey season. He plays, he plays over 200 shows a year. Okay. 200 shows a year. He, most shows do not start at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, right? No, he plays every Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Okay. And a lot of times on Sunday. Okay. So Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then you, if you're going to go turkey hunting, which usually starts at, what, 3 a.m.? Right. Right, so you, you, you're you pretty much just going right from the show um, mm-hmm. to uh, wherever you're going to hunt. And there's, there's not much right. time in between. That's that's Great. Right. So how we were doing it, we uh, we looked at his schedule, and so like he had a show at the Grand Ole Opry. And there was the Kenny Rogers Tribute Show in Nashville. Hmm. And then the next show was in Kentucky the next day. So right after that show, we left, drove to Kentucky. We were on his bus, so there's a bus driver, so we'd sleep. And when we got to where we were going, he would wake us up, and we'd throw camo on and walk off the bus and go hunting. It's quite a hunting rig. That is quite <laughs> Every day. a hunting Every rig. Every day, man. Yeah. Let's, take and, the, let's take the bus to the, to the hunting spot. <laughs> that's what we do. We roll right up, right up to the farm. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious. And, uh, it was fun. I mean, a lot of people made that happen. You know what I mean? I was, I was putting it out there on Facebook, like, Hey, is there anybody in like around Pikeville, Kentucky, you know, which is yeah. who the heck lives there, you know? And, you know, a good friend of mine lived 40 minutes from there. It was like, Hey, I, I'm, I'm around there. Why? What's up? You know what I mean? And then I tell him to call me and, and we were doing that every single show we were, somehow finding people to let us hunt and it was it was tough because you only get to hunt one morning right. you know by the time you figure them out you gotta go to the show yeah so right you're not gonna we didn't have kill a we didn't kill we didn't kill a ton of them but we killed enough of them to make it a lot of fun yeah you gotta so. you're, you're right you can't you can't figure the birds out and they do have habits and patterns so you gotta figure that right. out you know but right and and i mean and and we do it in deer season too no kidding Wow. But I just didn't get to hunt this deer season, so <laughs> I left it out of there. 
let's let's dig into some of your knowledge of deer hunting <laughs> even though you don't get to do a lot of it these days you must have to give them some you know direction. i don't get to pull the, i don't get to pull the trigger right. I, I don't pull the bull back but i'm still hunting man if if you're in that tree with a camera you better be a hunter and know exactly what's going on and what deer are doing and their behavior and everything else because if not you're gonna be the one that messes it up and I swore to myself, I am never, ever going to be the guy that messes up a deer of a lifetime for somebody. So what, what do you, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, what are you putting yourself through to make sure that if you're the guy carrying the camera, that you're not the one messing up the set? Because I mean, it's hard enough with one hunter. How do you do it with two and coordinate all that stuff? It's not easy. <laughs> I, no doubt but, no doubt Let's i mean some of the details like how do you i go, I go to the tree like i'm hunting i mean right scent control is huge i mean i put my camera in the ozone bag you know um yeah everything i make sure deer are not going to smell me i mean they're still going to smell you you know what i mean but everything you do helps a little bit then making sure whatever stand we get the wind's right mm-hmm. um i'm always on the apps like checking the wind direction, checking the barometer, doing everything and going over it with Aaron or rock or Chuck or James, whoever, making sure we're in the right set. Yeah. You know, that it's going to work because you can't just pop yourself up in any tree and have all that extra scent and everything else and think you're going to kill a deer. Right. Right. You so know, you actually put your camera in, in the ozone. I do. Does, yeah. that, does that affect the camera at all? It hasn't broke it yet. Wow. Because I mean, it, ozone is pretty damaging molecule, right? It's it's not it the is. most friendly thing in the world. It attacks everything. No, that's why it it's does. good for for it's scent because it, kill, it it just grabs everything that's close. So if you right. get, get any loose particles, I, I, I mean, I don't know what the long term effects of setting a camera in an ozone environment is like, but um, you got to think that it's not the best place for it. It's better than when you blow ozone in your face, right? Yeah, you know? right. So so scent control. But, that's number one for, for you guys. How do you how do you right. maintain scent control? Like, is it just ozone? Or you you like washing clothes too? If you're no everything, washing clothes. I mean, every step of scent control from brushing your teeth with uh, the toothpaste. Mm-hmm. You know that. Yep. Kills you. I mean, ninety percent of human odor comes from your mouth. Right. You know so. I've heard a that a bunch. Don't don't, don't take that into a, account. You know, they just walk out and spray your clothes down and call it a day and hop in a tree. You know, it's and nothing's nothing's a hundred percent. You know what I mean? So everything you do, you're just trying to up the odds a little bit. So ninety. So the more you, the more you could do, obviously the better. Let's talk about this ninety percent human yeah. odor comes from the mouth. I mean, yes, I've heard this a million times, and I'm I'm pretty conscious about it. But I think every if 90% of the odor comes from your mouth, then shouldn't we focus 90% of our effort on the mouth? Right. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I mean, and they have gum and they have toothpaste that kills those odors. And I don't see a lot of people using them. And to me, that seems like we're focused on the, the very, other 10%, very percent, right? I mean, think about it. Everything's covered up. I mean, you have yeah. layers upon layers upon layers on your body. Mm-hmm. Your mouth, your face, your head are exposed. Where does that study come from? Or so, I don't know if it is a study or if it's just something that a rumor. Yeah, I, I mean, it's just something I've always heard, you know. Yeah. But then you think of it, you're that's what that's what's exposed, mm-hmm. you know. So most, and, and maybe that's how they mean it, you know, is when you're when you're layered up, ninety percent of the odor deer is going to smell is coming from. Right. from your mouth and what's weird is you can't really smell whatever it is i know i'm gonna uh do everything i can to try and block that right. out so and what's weird is you can't really smell your breath real well right maybe no. if you eat eat something that's different but right. I, I don't that's a, dude, i don't eat onions hmm. like i refuse to eat onions because onions have a strong smell to me okay so i won't eat onions because i think the deer will smell the onions like i get i get kind of insane with it Onions, but, okay, all right. But garlic is another one. Yeah, garlic's a big one. You know, um, whether that makes a difference, I don't know. I mean, but I don't. It doesn't hurt. Yeah. You know. So is, is I killed some big deer. 
toothpaste yeah. the only thing? They, <laughs> so you avoid, you avoid certain foods, but is toothpaste like the only thing other than avoiding certain foods that you use to like neutralize? There's a there's a couple of companies that make a gum, okay, um, and a mouth spray, okay. That to me is essential in having it in your backpack. Mm. You know. So do you have everybody chewing gum and spraying uh, mouthwash into your in your mouth? I do. Going? Yeah, I make sure of it. Wow. <laughs> Sitting in the tree, I'm like, here, take this. Like, I don't want that. Like, you want to kill a deer? <laughs> like, that's, you know. Must make for some interesting audio when you're trying to, you know, cut in a <laughs> comment there. Right? Sure. I mean, you learn how to how to talk through it. See, these are all the little things that you just don't think about, right? About okay, right. The guys are chewing gum so they can keep their scent control down, and then you gotta you have to have a little comment that's whispered, and you gotta right. learn how to sh- shove the gum to the side of your mouth so that you don't capture the the, <laughs> the chewing on camera. It's the little, it's the little things. It's the little things. <laughs> these are the things that people don't appreciate. Right, right. <laughs> they think everybody's just entitled and gets to hunt all these spots where there's giant deer and they're in a thirty acre fence. And right. Gosh dang man. I mean, we only have thirty. <laughs> We only have 30 minutes, 21 minutes and 30 seconds of actual in-show airtime on a television show. Right. We got to break a whole season down into that. Of course, it's going to look like we hunted for two days and killed a giant. You know what I mean? Like, right. That's all the time we have. I mean, you do the best to try and bring across the whole season, but man, there's a lot more time and effort and everything else put into it than that. So if you're, if you're on the bus and you're trying to deer hunt, we talked about the turkey hunt and stuff that, and you know, I think you can wheel in and out of there without necessarily doing a ton of scouting, but you need to know the birds right. there. How, how do you, how do you handle the scouting? I mean, scouting is so important. It you... is, um, summer turkey okay. season, turkey season. Dude, we use turkey season to scout deer. Gotcha. I mean, everything's bare. I mean, you on early, early turkey season, everything's died off. You could see trails like, like nothing, man. I mean, bedding areas where deer are going to kicking out of them. I mean, we're taking all that in account. I make notes on the notes in my phone, you know, what I'm seeing on the properties where we're turkey hunting. So I know in deer season where to be concentrated on and hanging stands. And I mean, then we go in the summertime, always running trail cameras um, and just always taking that information and just, just trying to figure it out. So you're, you, because you're not there all the time, and because you're not spending an entire year scouting these areas, you're, right. you're taking the information you can gather when you're there during turkey season or some of the summer stuff. Right. Are you, are you guys hunting like food plots or anything like that? Or are you just going off of trail information and bedding zones? No, no, we have food plots. Um, that's what we'll do. We'll, um, and like one of our biggest leases is in Indiana with okay. Chuck. Um, and, we spend, shoot, I don't know, the whole summer planting food plots on our leases. I mean, we have we have leases in a few different states. And then there's some states we hunt with outfitters, you know, but we're very involved. We try to be involved in what's going on. Okay. You know? I mean, that's I guess that's part of my job, too, is to always have that information. Okay. And in the summertime to be going and doing everything I can to – help manage that property. So how do you go about a lease? I mean, some, some of us, um, me in particular, that's kind of a foreign concept because I'm so used to hunting the wide open lands right. with traditional colonial use laws in, in New England. You know, right. Not, not needing to, to really lease New England, a lot of stuff. New England's tough, man. <laughs> it's tough hunting, man. It yeah, I mean, that's where Aaron's from. It's, I know he's it's what, tough. Massachusetts or Vermont or something like that. Yeah. He's originally from Vermont and lives in Massachusetts now. Okay. Western Mass. Yeah. I mean, it, it's tough up here for deer hunting right. in particular. The, the, I, the, the laws are tough. I mean, they make it a lot more difficult than it should be. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, both the leases, I mean, we just through people we know will find out the properties available. Okay. You know, so, I'll go up, say it's in, I don't know, Iowa. So I'll go up to Iowa and I mean, not just me, we all do, you know, we'll walk the property, look at it. Um, if we decide to lease it, we'll lease it. And then like you said, we don't live in Iowa. So we run cell phone trail cameras, you know, to 
get as much information as we can. We go up turkey hunt it. We go in the summer, plant food plots, hang stands, you know, on on what we figured out in turkey season with trails and uh, points. Like the Midwest, the Midwest, you always hunt a lot of points. Um, so, like, when a piece of woods jots out and another on the other side of the field, another piece of woods jots out, those deer always like to cross from point to point. Right. Shortest so distance. Short, shortest distance across the right. field. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so I always look for them and that's the first place I hang set. Okay. You know, just, just going off just years of hunting in those kind of areas. You know what I mean? That always seems a big box and to concentrate on them. That's so. a good point. I mean, if you look at these fingers uh, crossing egg, you, you got to think right. that, you know, that the deer, intrinsically white tails and I don't know, not so much muleys, I don't think, but white tails will always try to stick to cover. You know, if you've observed Absolutely. white tails for as long yep. as you and I have, you, one thing that you notice is that they love cover. They will stick Absolutely. to cover f- for all travel routes. They do not like being out in the open and exposed. Mm-hmm. They will to eat, but they're still on guard and travel, right. travel routes will be on stay in cover as long as possible until it's right. They have to. That's why they enter a food source at last light. You know, I mean, they're out of there at first light. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you got to hunt. And then people say staging areas, you know what I mean? But like, just like you said, those staging areas aren't wide open. You know, you're hunting a spot with some cover just inside the wood line off of a food source. Because those mature bucks aren't walking out in that field in daylight. Right. It's just, uh, they will in the rut. You know what I mean? There's those out there, but yeah. I mean, that's about it. Yeah. I mean, fortunately we don't get to hunt just the rut. So <laughs> we got to learn how to hunt them every single time of year. Yeah. How do you pick so, your outfitters? Uh, word of mouth people. Okay. Meet, meet them at shows. Um, like I said, I, I was a manager at an outfitting business for, for three years. So I met a lot of other outfitters through that. Yeah. And just, I don't know, we don't, we don't like to go with people that we don't know at all or people we know haven't hunted with or, you know, we want to make sure they're legit. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of outfitters now. It's almost like the television industry. Everybody wants to be an outfitter. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so that's tough. That's, I mean, uh, dude, we've gone places where it's been a disaster, you know, so you live and learn. Yeah. Gotcha. But, which is the way this, that's why we try and lease our own land, you know, to manage our own deer. And we know exactly what's going on. And we know that, you know, somebody wasn't sitting in that stand smoking for a week before we got there or you know, whatever. Yeah. Cause you can't control that stuff with, with an outfitter, no. right? You, but no, you, absolutely not. And you can't blame the outfitter. I mean, sure. they're trying to make money too. Trying to make I a mean, living. They gotta, they gotta have people in there. So yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, you, it's, all, it's no blame, but it still doesn't make you a, a no. more effective hunter because you, there are some things right. that you're aware of that you are trying to avoid. Like, absolutely. Like that. They're little things. Right. Any kind of contamination affects the deer. Yeah. It's, it's some sort of way. You may not even know it. You may think that that doesn't affect them at all, but it does, man. Once you change a deer's pattern, it's over. Yeah. I mean, the, the best way to kill a mature buck is for that deer to never know he's being hunted once the deer knows he's being hunted it's it's over i mean you may be able to kill him with a rifle because you see him moving through a thicket or something but yeah. you know they, <clears throat> for the most part to consistently kill mature deer they cannot know they're being hunted yep. you and, know they're not dumb animals as a creature a, a game creature right they're the game animals right um, they're not predators they're they're constantly learning how to how to flight they're not fighting they're flighting right, right? they're it's in survival mode survival the mode they are constantly trying to figure out right. how do i survive and the minute that something isn't nope. the same they're they're done you're gonna right they'll, they'll change their pattern i i mean things as as simple as where you put your steps on a tree when you hang a stand mm. you know like never face your steps towards the trails the made the major trail you know i mean you know and not just a not just a mature buck either but the doe i mean very rarely does a mature buck use the same trail as, mm-hmm. you know, a group of does. Right. So you got you don't want to mess them up either. 
because they start to get flighty, then the Bucks say, oh, you know, something's wrong over there. They're not going over right. there. They work together, right, so, to survive. Right, absolutely. They're a team. Right. So, like you said, I mean, you got to hunt and cover in thick areas where they absolutely have no idea you're there. Right. So. Gotcha. But in, in the same sense, one of the – I'm just rambling now, but one of the most effective ways um, to kill a mature buck is – my favorite time is the October lull. Everybody calls it the October lull. Yeah, right. Um, <clears throat> it's not really a lull. They're just not moving as much because they're kind of prepping up their bodies for the rut. So go into where you know the bedding area is, and you bump them out of the bedding area, and you hang a stand, and within 24 hours, he's coming back. Right. Um, that's worked a lot. <laughs> hmm. So they still know to be hunted to that deer that worked for them. You know what I mean? Right. They were able to effectively get out of the situation. Somebody came in there, they're out. So to that deer for that moment, that spot works for them. You know, next time they come back in there, the bed, you're there and it's over. Right. So, right. So, and you know, these are the types of things you picked up over the years and you figured it out. Right. Yeah. Spend a lot of time in the woods, you know, just cause I don't get to hunt as much anymore. I'm always in the woods. Mm-hmm. I watch, study every deer that walks by i don't care if it's a fawn i mean i watch i try to watch their eyes i mean i'll pick up binoculars and just watch their eyes and see what they're looking at and what direction they're looking and mm-hmm. i mean just every little small detail i can and it's gonna help you know details are important when you're trying to observe and study deer behavior in your your right. area right every little thing can be an indication of where that next set should be and when right yeah. Absolutely. If you want to consistently kill deer, yeah. harvest deer, however you want to say it, but there are the things you need to do. Right. Now, I mean, you could get lucky and, and walk in a place and, you know, take the biggest deer of your life, but to do it consistently, you need to really understand the animals. Right. And their habitat, what, where they want to be, when they want to be there and why. <laughs> and once you figure that out. You're going to be a lot more successful. Yeah, where they want to be, when they want to be there, and why. I mean, that's right. that's it. I mean, you got to figure that those those things out. Right. And if you're just guessing, chances yeah, are slim. It's not going to work. Not gonna work. And, and and to me, getting to hunt with the people people I've been able to sit in the tree with, you know, like like Chuck and James are phenomenal hunters. Yes, they are. You know, and listen to the things they say, and they'll listen to the things I say, and we kind of put it together and. You know, and the same with with Rock and, and Aaron and Steve is part of uh, On the Road, too. But, mm-hmm. I mean, just bouncing knowledge off, off of each other and never trying to think you know more than somebody else. Right, right. You know what I mean? But Or that you've figured it out. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. Once you think you have it figured out, they do something completely different completely. and then you're back square one again. Right. So, play, you know. play your odds, but don't ever think you get it all. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's get into a memorable deer hunt if we could. Uh, I know you've been on a bunch with a bunch of different people and all parts of the country. <sighs> can you can you think of one? Can you zone in on one that kind of sticks out? Maybe it's a recent one, or maybe it's your earliest one. I don't know. Gosh, dang man, that's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have to be a favorite, but something that kind of you might find unique. I. Uh, there's so many with other people, you know what I mean? That yeah. hunts I've filmed or hunts that I guided. I mean, hunts I've guided with kids and killing their first deer. And, or even with, I'll tell you all the ones that are even better than that were like the 70 year old men who have hunted their whole life and never yeah. seen a deer bigger than a hundred inches Right. and get them on and they kill a, a 175 inch whitetail. Right. Right. I mean, that's, that's special, you know, but I guess like for me, for deer, I killed, um, I killed a, a 208 in Ohio. Okay. What, what um, year, what year are we going back to? God, I'm so horrible at years. <laughs> what is it now? <laughs> 2019. Gosh, dang. <laughs> I mean, it was like, like 18 years ago or something. Okay. All right. So go, maybe a one ish, maybe. <laughs> uh, uh, God. Thanks for that. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I hunted, this was by myself, no camera. Um, I went and hunted Wayne National Forest. Okay. 
down in Adams County, Ohio. Yeah. And no idea what I was doing. Like there wasn't cell phones. I couldn't pull up Google Maps and turn it to 3D and see the terrain or anything else. I was just I pulled my truck on the side of the road and just threw a climber on my back and grabbed my bow and walked. And I mean, I knew uh, everybody always used to talk about Wayne National Forest. There's giants there and, you know, it was a great place to hunt. And it's, it's state land, you know, or yeah. whatever it's. So I walked, I don't know, close to two miles because growing up in Pennsylvania, you learn when you hunt state game lands. Yep that you have to go a minimal of a mile in the woods to get into the deer. Okay. That makes sense. For the most, for the most part, people go in, they only go a hundred yards, 200 yards off the road. Yeah. And that was, a, that was a study done by Pennsylvania state game commission that, because people are saying there's no deer on the state game lands and they did a study and found the deer for just pushed further back in the woods. Obviously it makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so people just don't get far enough in the woods. So I took that knowledge and just walked, man, and just kept walking, walking, started seeing the further you walk in, you know, I started seeing more deer sign. And then I got to where I started seeing some rubs, started seeing some scrapes and found three white oak trees that were dropping acorns. And I was like, Oh, this makes sense. You know, there, this is where I would be if I was a deer, you know, there's white acorns. That's, you know, that's always been known to be one of the top food sources for white-tailed deer. Yeah. So I climbed up in a tree, and an hour later, <laughs> 280 this deer walked underneath me, and I smoked them. <laughs> wow. It, it was like, it's a quick story, but... But but important. That, that, but, right. that, that one is huge, man, because I took just things I've learned, things I've heard, heard people talk about. I'd never been there before. I had no idea what I was doing, where I was going. Mm-hmm. You know, I just knew I wanted to get as far off the road as I could because it's public land and knew I wanted to find food as close to a bedding area as I can. So when I started seeing the rubs and scrapes come more significant, you know, I mean, where you can look around and see, OK, there's a rub there, a rub there, a rub there, a scrape there and a scrape there. You're close to a bedding area right? because, you know, a lot of times the mature buck is they make those signs close to their bedding area for, you know, establishing their home. And as soon as I saw that and saw the white oaks that were dropping, I knew I wanted to get up in the tree. And dude, it was, it may, it may not even have been an hour. And that deer walked down and I shot him at 20 yards. You, you pieced together <laughs> a bunch of different knowledge that you've acquired over the years and, right. and you made it happen in a short amount of time. And, and that's a lot of times that's all it takes, but you, you keyed in right. on, on pressure, you keyed in on bedding areas and you keyed in on food. Right. What, right. what else is there? And it was like, I got in, I mean, where those scrapes and rubs were, you know I mean? I seen it started getting thicker behind them. I made sure the wind was in my face to where I thought the deer would be bedding. Yep. You know I mean? It's just little things like that. Yep. And it, it all came together. And That's a great illustrated it was, story. It was, it was awesome. Right. <laughs> I mean, the deer was a tank, two drop tines, kickers everywhere. I mean, it was just, it was right. unbelievable. Right. So. I mean, what a good way to illustrate the, the quintessential elements of being a su- successful deer hunter. It's all right, right there in that one package. Perfect. Well said. Thanks, man. I've never really thought of it like that. Right. <laughs> all right. I just, I mean, it's almost like you don't even think of it anymore. You know what I mean? You, it's you hunt nature, so much right, and you learn right. so much. You just, you go in and you know exactly what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. You're not going to be straight off of that. And you know, that's what you got to do to. You know, and I say big deer and mature deer. I mean, there's so much of an argument anymore about, you know, people only shooting 170 inch deer or bigger. And I mean, that's not reality. You know what I mean? It's every big deer I shot, if a smaller mature deer, would have, more mature deer would have walked out before I would have, I would have took that deer. Yeah. You know, it's just. Just happened to be. It, it's, it's to what the hunt means to you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? To the size of the animal doesn't matter. Yeah. It's people get too wrapped up in that. I mean, I, I I don't care. I mean, a kid shoots a spike, you know, that's, that means just as much as a guy killing a 180 or 200. Oh, heck yeah. You know, if not more, it's size means absolutely nothing. All we try to do is kill is, is hunt mature deer. Right. You know, right. right. Four and a half, five and a half and older. Yeah. Um, yep. 
I like the mature aspect. Right. Um, but the hunt, the hunt, the meaningful hunt, I think is more important than that. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Um, yeah. And I mean, e- even, I mean, you said a memorable hunt. I mean, obviously my son's first year was shoot a thousand times more important than that one. I just told you about, but, yeah. you know, right. Things like that. Well, <clears throat> you just never forget them. Right. But yeah. the, the one you picked as, as it's a good illustrated point for all hunters to hear right. of four elements that you were keying in on and it worked. Right. Yeah. It doesn't always work. I mean, it just happened to work that time. Right. Yeah. You that's know? the other thing. Um, it doesn't always work that way, but no, it happened to work you, that you one can't, time. You can't get down when it doesn't work out. Right. You know, you got to keep at it. Eventually it's going to. Mm-hmm. If you stay true to everything you know and all the knowledge you have and everything you've picked up, it's it's going to work. You know, it's just, I mean, deer, deer, they're, it's, they're going to do what they're going to do, mm-hmm. you know? Yep. There's no, uh, there's a variable there that you can't control. And, right. Absolutely. Right. I always, um, I always explain it to people like a, like a dog. Like if you have a dog that, you know, is in the house, <laughs> you watch your dog. Like I watch my dogs, like there's no rhyme or reason to what they do. They want to lay down and take a nap. They lay down and take a nap. They want to get up and run around They get up and run around. Right. You know, there's no, there's yeah. no real pattern, but that's their home. Right. You know what I mean? So right. you can draw when some. You find out what a deer I know what they like to do, you know, so like I know my dogs. So mm-hmm. if you could take that in with a deer, a deer is an animal, so is a dog. Uh, it's a crazy way to look at it. <laughs> but not so but, crazy. But to me, right. it makes sense. Right. And it's it's worked. Man. I, I mm-hmm. mean, if, if you just figure them out, man. You got to think like they, you like you believe they think. And like you said, they're just, they're just trying to survive, yep. Yep. you know. Just doing their thing. So, all right, let me hit you with ten rapid fire questions here, and these Oof. are these are not like I've heard, the, I've heard about these. This is just opin- <laughs> opinions. They're not anything other than that. It's just to try to get to know you a little bit better. All right, all right. What's your number one hunting tip of all time? Wind. Okay. We all have these things. <laughs> that, just like well, one one word answers. Just that's quick it. As I can. What, what, right. Whatever comes to your head. This is this is. Oops. There's no right or wrong answer here. Okay. Um, we all have these things that we sometimes hate hunting without. If we don't have it, we feel naked in the woods. What's that one thing for you? A range finder. Very common answer. I'm with you. No, it's, is it? It is. Well, I didn't think about it. I mean, if, okay, I got my bow, but how far away are they? Like, let's, let's right. use some technology yeah. to really zone that in. Right. Yep. No, that makes sense. Uh, what's your biggest pet peeve in life? In life? Oh, gosh. Oh, wow. There's so many. You hit me with a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> um, tardiness. Oh, look, that's a good one. Uh, yep. Uh, so how old are you today? 41. 41. What would you tell the 20-year-old J.C. Hall, knowing what you know today? <laughs> uh, don't take anything for granted. Very good. You're at a hunting convention somewhere in the world, and a stranger comes up to you. You strike up a conversation. They ask you what you do for a living. What do you tell them these days? I'm an outdoor television producer. Very cool. What did you have for breakfast this morning? A banana. Love it. (laughs) You can have your own billboard on the side of a highway, completely blank canvas. You can advertise, say anything you want. What would it say? What are you doing? Question mark, exclamation point. Hmm, I like that. That's, that's (laughs) a new one. I haven't heard that one yet. Good. If I say the word, it goes, it goes throughout a lot of things. It sure does. It sure <laughs> Going does. On in the world right. right. Now. If I say the word successful to you, who's the first person that pops into your head and why? Uh, my mother. That's a good one. We get dads a lot, but mom, that, that's, <laughs> that's unique. That's good though. I like it. Uh, yeah. What's a typical day in your life look like? Oh gosh. I wake up, go to the gym. Mm-hmm. This is recent, <laughs> right? It's a big thing. We're trying not to die early, right? Um, then come back to the office and open my computer up on what project I'm working on, and start working, looking at my emails, phone calls, back to editing, phone calls, back to editing. Um, I usually forget about lunch. <laughs> right. It's pretty much it, man. It's a lot of a lot of office. Um, most of the time, unless it's hunting season. 
Gotcha. And then it's, I'm still doing the same thing, but in the woods. Okay. So my last you question know? applies to deer, deer season. And when you do get the hunt or maybe when you just, just hunting with somebody else, what's the typical deer hunting day in your life look like? Long. <laughs> Early to rise, it's, uh, late it's, to bed. It's, it's 3 a.m., mm-hmm. get up, have coffee, um, have a very, very light breakfast, um, and then put your time in. Yep. You know, it's 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 a lot, a lot, a lot of long days, a lot of aggravation, a lot of confusion, and then hopefully one day it all comes together to excitement and pays off. But overall... Any day you get to spend in the woods is better than anything else. Right. Except for spending time with your family. So, um, like I said, what you said about a 20 year old kid, what do I tell him? Just never take anything for granted. That's what I always try to do when we are hunting somewhere is never take for granted where I'm at and what I'm doing yep. and being blessed enough to be paid for it. So, that is awesome. Just, just try and stay humble and, never forget where I came from and how hard I worked to get there. Very cool, man. That's, that's and hopefully kill a deer. There you go. <laughs> that's just the bonus at the end. Right. Man. Throw, throw that in there All on right. top of that. No, that's, that's, I mean, it's great but, advice and I, I appreciate you kind of, but it's on, honestly, when I'm in a tree, that's the things I'm thinking of, Yep. you know, in the downtime, you know, when kind of deer movement stops, slows down and you have time to reflect. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, that's why, that's why a lot of people hunt, you know, it's quiet. You have time to reflect on things like that. Yep. And if you're not, that's you're really what you should be doing. Yep. That makes so. a lot of sense. JC, I gotta say, man, this has been an awesome hour and just kind of going into all the things that make you tick. It's been very educational and I appreciate you kind of thinking about those things that uh, kind of second nature to you, but realizing that, Hey, you know what? I kind of figured something out and hopefully that, that information yeah. and that, that data, that uh, that advice will, will carry on to somebody else listen to the show and help them be better deer hunters and people and individuals right. down the road. That's all we could ask for. Say, man. <laughs> but, man, I really, really appreciate you having me. I'm honored and humbled that you even asked me. So I appreciate it. Awesome, man. Where can, the, where can we find more about you if uh, if we had more questions, if we created more more qu- questions than answers as we went through this? <laughs> um. <laughs> Is social media on social media. There you go. And, um, heck, that's where I'm most available, I guess. Okay. And, uh, you know, uh, on the road has a page and so does open season. Yep. So through any of those channels. And then, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll throw a plug that, um, watch open season on pursuit and on the road on Sportsman Channel and Outdoor Channel this year. Very cool. I'll, so. I'll check that out as I'm sure other yeah, people man. will too. And I, JC, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. Spend no, a little, little bit it. of time with us. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, hopefully we can do it again sometime. Well, thanks to JC for joining us on the big buck red street deer hunting podcast. It's, it's a challenge. I think when you're on the road and you're trying to film for all these guys that have a deer hunting television show, you still got to be a good hunter. You know, you still have to be able to get up in the tree stand and definitely not uh, mess up their hunts. And I don't know, maybe it takes even more skill than trying to set up those guys for their hunt and, and not uh, moving the camera too much or all that stuff. So I think JC is a pretty darn good hunter. I wish he had a little bit more time to hunt, but I certainly understand where he's at. And uh, we, we definitely appreciate the production stuff he's doing with Open Season and on the road with Aaron Lewis and Rock Bordelone and James Blank and Beckler over at Open Season and Chuck Paddock. As you know, we're we're big fans of all that that stuff, and uh, keep up the good work, JC. We appreciate it. Dusty, where can we find you when you're not hanging out here in the studios with me? Uh, shoot me an email, Dusty at BigBuckRegistry dot com. You can look me up on Instagram and Twitter at Chasing Antler, Facebook dot com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors. Jay, where can the people reach out to you when you're not on the mic? Likewise, you can shoot me an email, jay at bigbuckregistry.com, and you can visit us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We're also on Twitter, which is twitter.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. We are also on Instagram, instagram.com forward slash bigbuckregistry, and YouTube, which is youtube.com forward slash bigbuckregistry. On YouTube, you can listen to all of our podcasts in their entirety. 
far as videos are concerned. It's a boring video, but the audio content is there, so you can actually listen to our podcast. You can also listen to all of our live shows that we've done on Thursday nights when we do do them, and we've gone back and interviewed re-interviewed a lot of our previous guests we had on the show just to put a face to a voice. Let's put it that way. You can always listen to our show on other places as well, not just YouTube. We're found on Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, and as an Amazon Alexa skill. Go to Alexa and say, Alexa, enable Big Buck Registry. And if you would like to submit a buck to our page for consideration and be featured on our page in front of 250,000 diehard deer hunting fans, all you have to do is go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash my buck and all of the instructions will be right there. I think that's pretty much everywhere we're at. I think that's a wrap, Dusty. That's a whole lot of big buck, Jay. Sure is. I'm Jay Scott. I'm Dusty Phillips. And this is the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. We'll see you next week. (laughs) 